Hello everyone, so I'm going to be um, covering the solutions to the 2023 CCC Junior Track. Um, yeah, so I'm, most of my solutions are going to be in C++, but I'm also going to explain the algorithm for the problem in general, so feel free to implement it in whatever language you prefer. So I'm going to start with the J1. I'm not going to be reading through the problem statements because I'm going to assume you already read through them. So if you haven't read through them yet, you can take your time to you know, find the problem and read through the description. So in J1, all we have to do is we have to output 50x minus 10y, and then we add 500 to our answer if x is greater than y. So we can do this very easily. We can have two variables. I'm just going to call them n and m. So n is the number of successful deliveries, and m is the amount of unsuccessful deliveries. So um, we could just have this in, I'm just going to return to here have this in a single line so we have to do n times 50 minus m times 10 and then we need to add um, 500 if n is greater than m so I'm gonna use a ternary statement uh, 500 and 0 otherwise and we can have a new line here this should be everything and let's try out the test case 5 that's not 5, 5 and 2, and we get 730. We can try out this other test case over here, and that is negative 100. So, we can submit now. And there we go. Simple. So for the J2, again, this is a very simple problem. We're given a number n, and we want um, the next n lines are these strings, and we want to match them with their Scoville heat unit. So all we have to do for this one is we just need to keep an answer variable and then when we get a string, we compare it with these strings over here. We need to find the Scoville heat unit for each and then add it to answer. So we can implement this very easily with a for loop and an if statement. So I'm gonna make another variable here called answer. I'm gonna set it to zero. And now um, we can loop through n. So this is, loop is going to run n times. So um, we have a string. We can see into the string. And now we just need to compare the string with each of these. So I'm going to first of all just put this here. See at the answer with the new line. Um, so if s equals. And yeah, this is going to take a bit. So I'm just going to fast forward the video here. And there we have it. We just have a bunch of if statements that compare to each of these strings, and we can test it out now. And that is correct. So we can submit, copy this, paste it here. And yep, there we go, accepted. So moving on to um, question three, I'm just gonna. So question three, we get an integer n followed by n lines of five characters each. And each of these lines, um, the characters are either a dot or a y, and we want to find the date where there's the most y's. So what we can do is, with the algorithm, we can first of all store all of these in an array, and then we loop through each letter in each of these. So we're gonna loop through the first letter first like this, and we count how many y's there are. There's one. Now we move on to this. There's two y's here. Move on to this. There's one Y here, and we move on to this, and there's three Ys here, and there's zero of them here. So we're gonna select the one with, with the most, and we're gonna print those out. So how do we select the one with the most? So we're gonna have a variable that keeps track of the highest um, value that we've occurred, that we've encountered so far, and we look through each of these values. So we have one, two, one, three, zero. We're gonna go through the first one. Um, this is a one, so our max is equal to one. Now we go to the second one, our max is equal to 2. We also need an array to keep track of our, um, like the indexes, the indices where we actually encounter this max value. So in this case, this is index 1. I'm just going to add the indices. So this is index 1. We have this, which is 1, and that's less than a maximum, so we don't care about it. Here we have number 3, so our maximum changes to 3 now, and the in index becomes 3. And then 4 is 0, and we don't care about 0 because it's less than 3. 
So our answer would be 3, and we need to add 1 because it wants us to have it as 1 index. So we can easily implement this in C++ now. Um, I'm going to keep this loop and this here. And I'm going to make an array to store this, to store these strings. And we're going to push the string into the array. So now we just need to go through each of the five days. So there we go, our code works now, and um, I essentially just implemented this logic that I went over in this drawing over here into the file, and we have, yeah, we just get the inputs, we go through each of these, and we, um, if it's the maximum occurrences, then we push the number to our answer array, and then we just print out each of these separate with a comma, except for the last one, obviously. So we can submit our code now. As you can see, it gets accepted. So moving on to the J4 now. So a lot of people struggled on the J4 because it looks like a really difficult problem, but my advice to anyone who's writing the junior competition is don't overthink it. Because after all, this is just a J4, an S1 or J4, and you can't really overthink this too much. So um, this problem essentially asks us to this. This problem essentially asks us to get the perimeter of these dark areas um, and they give us the input like this. So the dark areas are denoted by a 1 and the light areas are denoted by a 0. And we want the minimum area that um, fences up all of these dark areas. Okay, so with this problem, essentially the algorithm is very simple. So we don't have to overthink this at all. I'm just going to draw this out. So let's say these are dark. And I'm gonna switch my brush color in order to show the borders. So if these are dark, and what we can do is we can go through each of these dark ones and add three for each of them, because three is just the perimeter of the triangle. So this gives us nine, which is enough to pass the first subtask, because the first subtask says that black tiles will never be adjacent and the second row is fully white. So. Um, just multiplying the number of dark spots by 3 is enough to pass as a first sub subtask. Now, what if we want some to be adjacent, like this one over here? So I'm just going to expand this. Wrong color. It's like this. And this one has this dark, this dark, this dark and this dark. So in the previous algorithm that I just went over, what we would do is we would count the number of dark ones. In this case, there's four, right? And we four multiply that by three in order to get 12. So 12 is our temporary answer. And obviously that's not correct. The answer is eight because um, this, right? And this. So how do we implement this? So first of all, what we can do very easily is we can go through each of these, so we add three for each of these. However, if the one before it, if the one before it is also dark, then we subtract two. Why? Well, because if this one is dark, we've added three already, right? And if we add another three for this, we're actually counting this edge twice when we shouldn't be counting it at all because, well, both of these are dark, you don't need to fence off, like, you know, right? So instead of counting this edge twice, we don't have to count it at all, so we would subtract 2. So in this case, this would be counted as 3. And then we go on to this one, which is another 3, so this becomes 6. However, the one before is dark, so we're going to change this to 4, we're going to subtract it by 2, right? And then we do the same on the bottom row, which... Um, so this one is dark, right? We add, we add 3, that becomes 7. And the one before isn't dark, so we don't do anything. Uh, this one is dark, so we add another 3. However, the one before isn't dark, so we're not going to do anything. So our answer is currently 10.
But that's still not right, because our answer should be 8. The reason why this isn't right is because um, we've... So we fixed this issue over here with this edge. However, we're still counting the edges between the two rows twice, and we should not be doing that. So how do we fix this? Notice that um, there's two kinds of this edge combination. You can have this kind of a thing, or you could have this kind of a thing. So we ca we must count this one because they share an edge, right? They share uh, this edge over here. However, this one we don't do anything because they don't share an edge. They share a vertice, and that's different. So we don't do anything about this case. So in this case, we do the same thing as we did for all the other cases, and we just subtract by two because they share because we're counting this edge twice when we shouldn't be counting it at all. So if we go through this again, we're going to notice that, okay, so none of these, not both of these are black, and both of these are black, so we subtract 2. So now we become 8, and not both of these are black, and not both of these are black. So our final answer is 8, which is correct. So we can easily implement this in C++ with just a simple for loop. Um, Okay, so we're gonna So yeah, this gives us the right answer now. Uh you could test it with the other case, but I'm not gonna bother. Um and this is going to get accepted. And there we go accepted on J4. And finally we have the J5, which a lot of people struggled on, though it's not too difficult, I'd say. So on this J5, it's a word hunt. However, it's not just any normal word hunt, because when we're looking for a word, we can also have these weird L bends. So how can we implement this? So notice that first of all, um, the first three subtasks don't have any of these L bend shapes. So we could easily get the first three subtasks using any kind of search algorithm, really. Okay, so I'm gonna copy this. So the algorithm for this is actually very simple if we only want to pass the first few subcases. So what we need to do, essentially, is we are going to go through each of these um, letters. So first of all, note that we're looking for the word menu. This is a word that we're looking for. So we're going to go through each of these letters and we're going to search for the first letter. The first letter in this case is M. So we're going to search for M's in this and okay, so there's one, there's one, there's one, and there's one here, and there's one here. So what are we going to do with each of these M's? So what we're going to do is we're going to search for the next letter among the eight directions that we can go from M. So this is not E, 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 this is E, this is not E, and this is not E. So, okay, we found an E now. Um, we're going to continue going along this direction and see if we have an N. And there we have one. And uh, there's also an N here, but we're, this doesn't work because um, it's not in the same direction as our original uh, M and E. So. Finally, we search for U, and there's a word. So that's all we're going to do for the first three subcases. We're just going to search. It's just like a simple DFS. A DFS is just a kind of searching algorithm. So um, let's implement this. Let's get rid of all this code here. Uh, we're going to get a string. We're going to get the dimensions of this grid. So. All right, I'm gonna store the string in a variable called s, and then we're gonna have um, a vector of strings. So we're just going to push it back into the array, this is all for getting inputs. And now we're going to go and find M's. So we're going to loop through each of the... We're going to loop through the array.
So what this does is we check to see the letter at our current element, and if it's equal to the first letter in the string that we're searching for, then we do something. So what is this something that we're going to do? I'm going to be implementing a DFS or a depth first search for this. So I'm going to call it. Um, but first of all, we need to define the function. So let's define it. So I'm going to make a D for depth. We're going to make the X and the Y coordinates. And we're going to have the direction in which we're going. So int DX and int DY. So DX is the X direction that we're going through. So for example, take this here. So we're going directly down, right? So in this case, our dx would be zero because we're not changing our x value at all here. And our dy would be one or negative one because we're going down, right? However, it's probably easier to say one because in a computer, um, graphs don't look like this. They look like this. So um, that's gonna be our directions. And we're going to call our DFS here with a depth of zero because we're just starting out, right? And we're going to call it with our coordinates and a change in X and change in Y. We can go through all of our eight coordinates. If we assume that our beginning coordinates are zero, zero, this here is one, zero because that's a change in X. Uh, this is zero, negative one. This is zero, one. This is uh, negative one, zero. This is one, negative one. This is one, one. This is negative one, one. And this is negative one, negative one. So these are our eight directions and we're going to have to start a search in all eight of them. So let's just do that real quick. I'm gonna hard code it because I don't want my code to stretch from here all the way to the other side of my screen. So we're going to start off with negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, 0. I'm just going to let the AI generate it. And there we go. So these are all eight of our directions. And we're going to, first of all, we need to check some things. So if x is negative or x is greater than or equal to n, or y is negative or y is greater than or equal to n, we just return. Why? Because, well, if any of these are true, that means that we're trying to search for a letter that's outside of our grid, and that's not possible. So we're just going to return. So um, another condition here is if our array at our current x and y coordinates is not equal to s at d, which basically means if it's not equal to the next letter, then we're also just not going to do anything. So. If our depth that we're searching at is equal to the string size minus one, we need to subtract one because this is zero indexed. Um, then we increment our answer because, well, we've already passed all these checks, which means that we've found an entire word. So we're going to increment our answer and we're going to return. So now we can actually do our other code. So we're going to DFS in the same direction. So we're going to increment our x by its dx, increment the y by its dy, and pass it on. So now this should now this should pass the first three subcases. We can test that out. Uh, we get three for this subtask, which is correct. And I'm not going to bother with this one because it has L bends. So if we compile this and check it, yeah, as you can see, we passed the first three subcases, which is enough to get you onto honor roll if you're taking junior. At least I'm pretty sure it is. So now, how do we actually solve this entire problem now? It's not actually that much more different because we can use we can basically reuse almost all of the code that we've already gotten down. So we can find this one easily with our current code. We can also find this one easily with our current code. But how do we find these L bends now? So with our current code, our current code only searches in one direction. So if we want it to have these L bends considered, we just need to add an if statement. So first of all, we need to add an argument in our DFS storing whether or not we've already turned. If we haven't already turned, then we can always consider a turn in 90 degrees. So let's say we're starting with this N, we find A, we find T. So if turned is equal to false, then we're also going to send a DFS along these directions and not just this direction. 
So uh, we can easily do this. You can hard code this, or you can find a mathematical formula to do this. Um, so it's the same thing. We just we uh, one thing to consider though is that we can't turn on our first letter because we haven't actually established a direction that we're going in yet. If we're only on our first letter, right? So that's all. That's basically just the entire solution. Now we need a variable here. Bool turns equals false. I'm going to set a default value as false because I don't want to change all of these over here. So I'm going to set turn to false. Now, if we haven't turned yet and our depth is greater than or equal to 1, then we can consider all of our turning routes, sort of. So how do we consider those? I've already drawn out a direction wheel, but I'm going to redraw it again. wrong way so here we have our direction wheel again right and we can go through each of these directions and try to figure out something that's recurring about these so zero negative one we can turn to either one zero or negative one zero. How about um, so? Let's try to figure out something with this. So we've noticed that in order to do this, we've flipped around the x and the y, change in x and change in y, and now our two directions are just the plus minus of. So since we can't really find the plus minus of zero, we can't really accomplish anything from that. But we know that we flip around these two. That's the first thing we notice. So let's try something out with uh, 1 and 1, for example. So 1 and 1 can become 1 and negative 1, or negative 1 and 1. So we can't really tell that we're flipping this around. Um, but we're going to notice that um, when we flip it around, the two cases are when uh, we change the change in y to be negative and when we change the change in x to be negative. So that's literally just everything. Here, uh, we can just do that. Um, so we're only going to need to send two DFSs. We're going to see the AI has already generated it. We can uh, flip around the order of the DY and the DX and negate them. And for this one, we negate the DX. So uh, something that the AI has messed up on, though, is it hasn't incremented these properly. So we need to immediately apply these changes. Therefore, we need to. Um, change the y and the x according to what we just did. So now let's try this with our code over here. And as we can see, we get 4, which is the correct answer. So I forgot to pass along our turn variable here, which is extremely stupid of me. But um, now this should be accepted. Because when we've already turned, we need to make sure that we've that we pass along the information that we've already turned. We're also going to try to make multiple turns. And there we have it, all accepted, and that is the entire solution to all of the junior problems this year. So uh, on the actual competition, I finished in under an hour, which is very funny, but yeah, that's about all. So thanks for watching, and I know this is kind of like a video that's really different from what I usually make, but I, I just wanted to make this channel, this Kavaluya channel, a uh, place where I post things that I'm interested in. So, hope you understand. So, thank you for watching. Hope you learned something new, and I'll see you in the next one.